Okay. The following interview was conducted with Ch uh, Charles L. Reichert, Professor Emeritus of Agronomy for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Thursday, um, June 16, 2011, at his residence in West Lafayette. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian, and also sitting in is his wife. Thank you. Welcome. Let's start. Tell us a little bit about where and when you were born and parents and siblings in early years. Um, I do not have a typical background for uh, a college professor. I was born and raised 220 miles straight west of here at Cameron, Illinois, on a farm um, on April 7th, 1929. Um, neither of my parents had gone beyond the eighth grade. And that was very, quite usual in, in that, at that time because most of them, they went through uh, their one-room country school, 14, and they um, started working on the farm and got married and continued farming. Um, my dad's name was James Reichard, and uh, uh, my mother was a Swede, uh, Blanche Olson, born at Disco, Illinois. Believe it or not, Disco, Illinois. There's still a sign there, Disco, that's all that's uh, left there. The farm, interestingly, the farm that I was born on and raised on was purchased in 1838 by my great-great-grandfather, Joseph Reichard. My two sisters and I still own that farm. And, uh, Is it so, still being used? I mean, are they still farming on it? it, 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 it yes, but we rent it out. It's, sure. Uh, uh, if I hadn't gone to college and on, I might have well been farming there now. Um, and I, that, I've thought about that several times, and I thought, well, that would have been a very satisfying career, but what I was able to do was even more exciting, but I wouldn't have known that option right. uh, had I done that. And uh, I had two sisters, uh, one old, two years older and one two years younger. Uh, my older sister is a professor at Western Illinois University in what was used to be home economics and now is consumer and family sciences or foods and nutrition. And uh, my younger sister was a, a, a business manager of a printing company in Gillsburg. And so all three of us did quite, did quite well. Sure. Um, I, as far as the early years are concerned, you know, um, I grew up, kind of entertaining myself or playing with my younger sister because my older sister helped mom in the, in the house. And, and uh, so we spent a lot of time together. And um, the one thing that I remember, uh, which is somewhat typical of that time, was that I started milking a cow before I started grade school in this, in, at six years of age. We had a small Jersey cow it wasn't easy to milk, but with little hands, it uh, worked out all right. So I got started uh, milking early. Um, maybe another reason I left the farm. <laughs> That's seven days a week, twice a day at four o'clock in the morning and four o'clock mm -hmm. in the afternoon. What was uh, great? What was grade school like? Was um, it small school? It, uh, the uh, my grade school was fantastic. Believe it or not, <clears throat> I had the same teacher. It was three quarters of a mile away. I walked, and as they say, uphill both ways. But it was a little terrain there, rough terrain. Um, but I had a fantastic teacher, Mrs. Esther Watson. And she was uh, very strict. Um, she slapped me with a ruler once. I threw a paper wad. And so I, I deserved that. It, I think it hurt her more than it did me that that, that happened. But she, usually there were maybe 14 in school. And sometimes I had one classmate, and I think most of the time I did not have a classmate. And I um, um, enjoyed geography and arithmetic. And I would get all my papers right, but she would not give me higher than a 99 on my report card, because she said, if I give you 100, that means you know what ever, know everything, and you don't know everything. Um, so I, I handled that okay. But I had a, a real good education in grade school, and she always kept pounding it into her heads. You've got to know this, because when you go to Galesburg, 
we'd go to the ninth grade in junior high and then three years of senior high, you've got to know this. And the interesting thing was when I got to junior high and high school, I did know that. And in a way, it wasn't good for me because I learned to loaf, or I shouldn't say I learned to loaf, I could loaf. I didn't have to work very hard to stay ahead of the uh, uh, other students. And uh, being from the environment that I was from, no one ever talked about going to college. No one in the family had ever gone to college. And so I wasn't on any pre-college program or anything. And in my senior year, there was a, oh, one other thing I got to mention is that I rode a train. I had to ride a train to um, high school. It came at 10 minutes to seven. I had to be, I got up at 5.30 every morning and started to cook stove, fire to cook my breakfast, walk over to the, to the uh, uh, railroad crossing where I could flag, I had to flag this one little doodle bug, we called it. It was a diesel at that time. There weren't very many of those. And um, I'd go to school, and I'd be there at school early, but I had to leave school um, a little bit after three, so I never had a study hall in high school. I, 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 I've never been in a study hall. <laughs> uh, but um, in my senior year, there was a uh, announcement of a um, scholarship to the University of Illinois by Warren County, the county that I was in. Our high school was in Knox County, but for that county. And so, I don't know, I just kind of decided, what have I got to lose to take the test? Well, I won the scholarship, and at that time, it was right after World War II. I graduated from high school in 47. War ended in 45, and they had uh, a large number of GIs coming back on the GI Bill going to college. And so they opened up a under, undergraduate division of the University of Illinois in Galesburg. It had been a uh, male hospital for paraplegic soldiers. It was all on one floor and all ramps. And we had about 2,000 students there. And it worked out very nicely. And I could continue to commute to um, college for my two first two years because uh, there wasn't much of any money in the family for college uh, purposes. So I completed my first two years there and I wound up, as you know, receiving several counseling awards. And I think I learned during that period because I told you about grade school and my teacher was very strict and really made a study and good study habits. Went to high school, not any pressure on there to work hard. Yeah. And I, I tried to go to college that way. <laughs> and I, I never was on probation, but I started out kind of slow. And with that small uh, school, there was a, a young man that sat beside me that always got one letter grade higher than I did. And I just kind of felt like he's not any smarter than I am. Why does he get higher grades than I do? So I, I thought, well, I'm just going to follow him when we leave class. We'll see where he goes. Well, you know exactly where he went. He went right straight to the library. So I started doing that too. And that was the most amazing change that uh, I'd had in my life that I went there. And it come 10 o'clock at night and I had my homework done before I was staying up till midnight, one, two o'clock, doing the work that I should have been sure. doing when I was sitting having fun with the other, with the other students. And so I, I really learned about using your time and the study habits and so forth. And so then after two years, because that's all they had was two years. They, o they opened just a two-year program there. It was a two-year program, and there was really no agriculture program. So um, I took chemistry and English and all those courses, that non-agricultural courses. And at that time, that was kind of tough because you'd, you, you'd like to have an ag course in there. Yeah. But when I transferred to the University of Illinois, then I got to take all my ag courses. But when I transferred to the University of Illinois, I decided I'm gonna get all A's. I, I'd come from one extreme to the other and knowing that I could do that. 
And the first semester there, I got all A's but one B. And the B, I had the highest B in the class. Okay, I know that because I went in and talked to the instructor because I felt like I should have had an A in that one too. And uh, I didn't get it changed or anything, but I, I realized that, you know, working at that like I did, that I was going to get A's and B's. And so I continued um, there um, with the same study habits. I worked my way through school, so I had, I, 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 we had a coal-fired furnace in the house. There was 29 boys that stayed in it, and a farm lady that her husband had gotten killed in a tractor accident, so she took her money and came to Urbana and bought this big house and, and rented it out, and she favored we ag boys, and so it was a nice environment. And uh, I worked two blocks away at her friend uh, had w with a very similar situation. I mean, her husband was still alive, but he'd gotten his leg wrapped up in a corn picker, and it was he couldn't do anything. So she had uh, uh, Jewish girls. She kept uh, Jewish girls, and there were 80 in the house. And so my roommate and I were the uh, waiters there. And so three times a day, morning, noon, and night, we were there. Uh, she did on. the cooking and then served in the house. No, she she oh. had a she had a cook. Oh, she had someone she, do that. She had a okay. cook, mm -hmm. and she 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 had her husband there, and she had her daughter. Um, that husband was in the military and had a little grandchild, and so she she was she kept busy managing sure. uh, the house, and. Uh, uh, the other thing that I did as an undergraduate. It kind of carries over to what I did at Purdue. Um, I was elected the first semester there by my uh, peers in the house as, in, as manager of sports for the house, for intramural sports and organizing teams and that sort of thing. And I like sports. I really enjoyed sports. And so to me that was fun. And uh, it was something that I could fit into my schedule. And I wished I had counted the trophies that we won, but she had a mantle with no trophies on it when I came there, and it was clear full when we left. And I wasn't good at basketball, but I'd never seen a basketball. And, you know, John Wooden, he was on the farm with a peach basket to, uh, to shoot at, but I didn't. <laughs> didn't it ever. was more common in Indiana than Illinois, I gather. <laughs> probably. Uh, well, anyway, but. Uh, we won football, basketball, and volleyball, and then they also had co-rec sports, and I organized teams that there had to be so many girls and so many boys on the team, uh -huh. and even in softball, and the, the the boys had to bat. If you were right-handed, you had to bat left-handed, that sort of thing, and so um, I enjoyed that, and uh, had kind of an amazing knack for identifying talent because I could go recruit other if we were Played, short yeah. so um, I usually had some pretty good teams and and I enjoyed that I was active in the agronomy club um, I, I never considered um, a fraternity because of my meager background and the money and so forth and uh, uh, but we'll talk about later I did join yeah. a fraternity here. The house that you lived in sounds a little bit like a co-op. Did everybody? Did you? Is that was it? Was it similar or? Um, well, or was it something under the, under the residence halls? No, oh. no, it was an independent house. Okay, so you just paid. It, you, right. Yeah, and you know it was about a dollar a day at yeah, that oh, time. Oh, sure, right. I think if it was, I think it was thirty dollars a month. Right. Okay. And uh, uh, it was a nice facility, uh, and the house mother kind of screened us. And, and then would encourage us if you know somebody else that's a good student. We were usually the high independent student house on campus on grade wise. Yeah. And I never thought about it till some years later and one of my adjoining uh, in the next, room, next to, room next to me, he became an English professor. And, um, and getting together with him, he always liked it. He knew all the our academic records and so forth. I, didn't even know those things ex <laughs> existed at that time. So uh, that's pretty much 
sure. Yeah, well, they used to, around the university, there were a lot more houses than there are now, and people, when uh, early faculty came, said, shared with me, they got a, maybe little apartments or some rooms or something in a house. So it was a similar situation for that, that time era. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, there, and there wasn't much university housing in comparison to what we have now. It, there, there had to be more uh, independent right. Right. housing. Um, and so I graduated in yeah, and then you went on, you stayed on, and then, or then, then you came well, to Purdue. How'd that come about? Well, um, the interesting thing is when I graduated in 51, I interviewed, because I, I didn't know anything about grad school. Was yeah. your major in agronomy or? My major was in agronomy, okay. yes. And I had a, a, a professor um, that was kind of a grandfather image to me, and I did well, and he was pleased with me and that sort of thing. And I w- actually worked part-time for a, a graduate student in the agronomy department mm. in, on his research project. And w- but when I graduated in 51, uh, I interviewed a number for a number of jobs, and I stayed on campus interviewing. Um, and I, I got two offers. Both of them were selling life insurance. And I wanted to work with a seed corn company or an agronomic position. I have nothing against it. I have good friends that are insurance right, salesmen. Your major was job. in the other area. Uh, yeah. Yes. But um, I've kind of thought afterwards, I wonder why I interviewed for those. <laughs> but there weren't many uh, interviews. But anyway, I was telling my, the grad student I was working for that I just couldn't find anything. Work. He says, well, why don't you go to grad school? I said, I don't know anything about grad school. And so that's when I went to see my advisor and talked to him. Two weeks later, I was in grad school because with good. my grades and so forth, I had no trouble. No they they were excited. And I even got an assistantship. So then I wouldn't have had to continue working, but I, the, I stayed in the same house and had firing the furnace because we had a stoker, you know, you know, and I have to fill it once a day. And I'd wash windows when they needed to wash, and I mowed the lawn in the summertime, mm-hmm. and that sort of thing. So I just kept on doing that. And so I had quite a bit of money then. I got an assistantship. And I got an assistantship working on, on screening uh, chemicals for herbicides. And they were byproducts from um, um, jet fuel. And I, I found one that caused albinism in plants which was quite a striking discovery, and got two scientific publications, one in the Botanical Gazette and one in Scientific American, fairly prestigious yeah. journals for an agronomy student uh, starting out to get in. And um, everything went well, and after uh, two summers and two semesters, I had my master's degree. You're at Illinois still? At the University of Illinois, right, yes. Okay. And, um, at that time, the Korean War was going on, and I, my draft board, I had gone to take my physical earlier. And in Chicago, they told me I have calcium deposits on bone spurs on both heels. It says we could take you, but you can't get through um, basic training, and so you're 4F. So I go back, and that's okay. Um, and then the draft board sent me a card. I was A1. And I was in college, so I thought, well, and it said when you can continue, but when, when you finish your college program, then you, you have to let us know. So when I got my master's degree, I let them know. And, uh, and this was at the time that I had met um, Eileen, uh, just a, well, that exact same time, because um, her brother was my roommate in college. So I knew all about the family and, and that sort of thing for several years, been hearing about him. I knew he had a sister over to Illinois State University. And he got married August 1st or 2nd in 1952. And I was best man. And my wife, Eileen, was uh, in the wedding party, huh? she, you know, she was in the, in the ceremony. And we, we got to talking a little bit and said something about doing something and we couldn't, that didn't work out. And I said, well, I'll come over to Illinois State University and see you. And so as I mentioned before we started the program, I like to ride motorcycles too. So I rode my Harley Davidson over there. The Harley Davidson didn't impress her. But uh, anyway, uh, that was the beginning of a, 
fantastic uh, relationship. And uh, this Sunday, we celebrate our 57th wedding oh, anniversary. Very nice. Yeah. Very and, nice. And um, on uh, Father's Day this year, too. Yeah, I, it's a big day June for me. 19th. It's a big day for me. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, um, I went to the draft board and said, here I am, ready to go. <laughs> and so... Uh, they like it, people that are eager. Well... They don't get many. You know... Uh, <clears throat> and their response... You, you just feel like you, sure. everybody else is going, so you right. do your duty. Yeah. And so um, it wasn't very long, within a month or so, they sent me to Chicago for an induction physical, uh, for induction. And I got up there and they said to me, they said, what are you doing up here? I said, my draft board set me up. <laughs> and they said, well, you're 4F. And I said, well, I know you told me that before, but uh, the draft board gave me a 1A classification. And so it was back home. And then here it was October and I couldn't go to school and it wasn't easy to interview for jobs and that sort of thing. But uh, uh, through my house mother that knew all these ag students, uh, there was a seed corn company at Piper City, Illinois, producer, producer seed company, that uh, was looking for an agronomist and hired me. And uh, it was a town of 700 and a really nice fam uh, uh, group of people working there. Um, I really, I had absolutely no complaints about it. But you go out to a town of 700 people um, after uh, working on a master's degree with grad students and professors and talking about this research problem, that research problem, and taking the advanced courses. And I really missed that. Yeah. And um, one, one nice uh, uh, um, uh, character, characteristic of my wife was she came from a family of educators and we had no people in education in our family and so I kind of liked that and and she and her family in, encouraged me and so uh, it was an easy decision to make to go to grad school and so I applied to a number of the Big Ten universities and and got a, a, an assistantship to Ohio State and went to Ohio State uh, in March of uh, 1954, and we got married in June of uh, 1954, and uh, got married on June 19th, Saturday night. I had to be back in the classroom to teach on Monday morning, so we had a short honeymoon. Um, but it worked out, worked out sure. very well. that's nice. And, um, the situation in Ohio State, their, their experiment station is 90 miles away. So the researchers are all at Wooster, and uh, the teaching uh, is at Columbus. And I didn't find myself in a very good situation, although academically I did fantastically well. I continued my A's uh, and, and, and that sort of thing. But um, research-wise and everything, things weren't going that well. And there was a professor or two there that kind of befriended me. And I found out about an assistantship at Purdue. And so after six quarters, a year and a half, I left Ohio State and came to Purdue. And I was here a year and three quarters, and I got my PhD. And it was one of those just fantastic fortunate moves for me that worked out really well. I have no hard feelings against Ohio State. It's a fantastic school. 60,000 students, it's a big campus, but you get used to it, and they have their medical school, dental school, and everything there. Mm -hmm. um, and as I think back, it was, if I could have maneuvered it, as, as, I would like to have gotten a master's degree there, because I spent the time and I did some research, and another quarter, and I could have but, you know, it uh, worked out, yeah. yeah it, it's not that big a deal. Okay. And so uh, I came to Purdue, and, and uh, uh, everything worked out really well. When you come switch in the middle of your PhD degree, not many people do that. When you go to the new institution, those professors don't know you. 
the ones back at Ohio State near me, and I was in good shape. And what well, it worked out to my benefit because when I went to take my writtens for my prelims, and the department head here, Dr. J.B. Peterson, was on my committee, and there was another grad student that we both were taking ours from him at the same time, so we got the same exam and walked in there at the office at 8 o'clock, and the other grad student was with me. And uh, he said, here's the papers and so forth. And you can take whatever time you need to do this. And then he looks at me and he says, Chuck, he says, I don't know anything about you. I hadn't been there very long. He says, all I'm going to know is what you write on, that piece, on this paper. And you can have all the time you want. And so I wrote from 8 o'clock that morning till midnight that night. I knew that much. <laughs> well, anyway, it turned out that he told my advisor, he said, it was just like reading a textbook. And so I was, I was in right there. And so uh, it wasn't long until I was on the teaching staff here as a grad student. Uh, it's a, I actually taught classes a little bit more than a TA. And um, then when I graduated, he wanted to keep me, but he says, I don't want to have a position for you. And so I took a position with the USDA, U.S. Department of Agriculture, Agriculture Research Service on the campus at Penn State. And he says, as soon as we get something that uh, would, would fit you, he says, we'll invite you back. And I said, that sounds great. And so we went to Pennsylvania, and Eileen was in um, deaf and hard of hearing, and special education and so she had a job there and and uh, I was at a research lab and we wound up we liked it out there we we didn't necessarily you know it's a job and we'll go there and do the best we can and in two years I got the call to come back and then we had to kind of make a decision and it wasn't all that difficult because if you're in agriculture you want to be in Indiana rather than Pennsylvania they have a decent Ag, ag department and everything, good university. But uh, um, then it turned out that I got the opportunity to come back and we did and um, something kind of unusual when we arrived, our furniture wasn't going to get here for a few days and we were going to live in a university house out there in the middle of the golf course. And so the department head said, well, you and Eileen can stay in our house. So we stayed at the department head's house for three or four days to, you know, it's, wonderful. It, it, it's just kind of a neat kind right. of relationship. Let me ask you, you, a house on the golf, where, whereabouts did you live when you came back then? Where the fraternity and sorority houses are now? Oh, uh, oh the There acres. used to be or a group acres. of um, like national homes in, in there. That They've torn okay. them down. And yeah. it, I've heard about I was trying to think where the location was, but yeah, I've heard of them. But uh -huh. that, that, I, I think by 68, when you came here, they were gone. Yeah, right. Uh -huh. uh, but I've heard people describe them, who, such as yourself, who lived in And them. it was kind of nice because we were all new to right. campus, and so we... And it was we, close to campus, too. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, it's just like the fraternities. It's sure, in that right. same area. It, right. it was a nice... It was just a, a nice location. But... Uh, and so from there, I joined a, a teaching group. Dr. Peterson was a very insightful, thoughtful department head. Um, pretty strict. Uh, what he wanted done, he expected to get done and that sort of thing, but I have no problem with that. And he had um, mostly uh, young um, GIs that uh, were on the staff at that time. And I spent my college career and my career with, sure. with the GIs. And um, no one ever held it against me that I didn't have a, some of them <laughs> even envied me, you know, somewhat. But uh, they were always great to me. And in grad school, it was fantastic, uh, uh, the mentoring that they uh, did for me and um, I remember being in a class and one of those I worked in a grocery store at A&P in Galesburg when I was in high school and college and there was one of those GIs that worked 
with me on Saturday part-time. It was a busy day in the grocery store in those times. And uh, we were in a, an accounting class together. And on Saturday when we were working together, I said, boy, that uh, accounting professor just keeps picking on me. And he says, you know why he's picking on you, don't you? And I said, no. He says, you aren't doing your homework. This is when I didn't have my good study habits. <laughs> you know, and I realized he, it was pretty simple, but I wasn't, I just wasn't doing it. So I started doing my homework and then he, <laughs> then he left me alone. You, you got the word. <laughs> yeah. But um, we had a, a Rudy Hiltz that later became a, a director of resident instruction and, and agriculture <coughs> and Byron Blair and uh, Wayne Kime was in genetics. He went to Colorado as the agronomy department head. Uh, Jim Ulrichs uh, mm -hmm. that you had mentioned uh, mm -hmm. on one of the occasions we were together. And uh, they're, they're just a, an outstanding group of uh, uh, young teachers. And um, we were encouraged and rewarded for teaching. And I'll never forget when I was being promoted for full professor. Uh, it, it, people wouldn't believe this in this day and age. But I had been at, at uh, when I was at Penn State, I was full-time research, so I did research and published, and then here, I came here in three years, I moved to a, uh, from assistant to associate professor, and then three more years, I was a, a full professor, and they were putting the documentation together, and Rudy Hiltz was working on that. And I said, Rudy, now don't forget, I said, be sure and emphasize these 40 publications. 40 is a lot of publications yeah. for somebody that says, he says, oh, no, 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 he says, we can't do that. We're putting you through on teaching on a, on a, as for expertise in teaching, and they see those 40 publications, <laughs> and they go say, he didn't have any time to teach. So he just picked out a few which he thought was the best. And put Interesting, through, and yeah. He went through, but uh, um, it was a, 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 a fantastic environment. Uh, our students were very bright, and uh, friendly, and um, no one was called Dr. Reichert or Dr. Hiltz. We were all on first name with the students. So we've had some guest professors come here and say, I like everything you do except that. But uh, we didn't change. And um, I wound up working a lot with um, student groups. And uh, shortly after I came, Farmhouse had some really good young men, and I had them in my class, and they invited me to become an associate member, and then I could be a faculty advisor and work mm -hmm. with, with the organization. And and I I admired those young men, and their motto is builder of men, and they were usually the high academic fraternity on campus, and m pretty much still are. Right. And so I joined that and served as faculty advisor on a number of occasions, and I was a member of the foundation board when they built the new house. There Where were they located before there? On Sheets. Oh, okay. But that, they had a big old house. Oh, did they? Like yeah. I lived in. It, sure. It, it, but um, it's long gone yeah. now. Um, and they're thinking now somewhat about building another house. But somebody told me it was cost them millions now. We built that house on the corner there for 300000 and. Uh, so I was in that house one time, a colleague of mine, one of the students invited us there for a dinner and event, and it was very nice. I really, I was pleased because I'd driven by it so often, so it was really a treat to, to go to something there. We, we had a nice, nice dinner, it was very nice. Yeah, I, I always enjoy going back there too, and um, have an awfully lot of uh, uh, good memories. Sure. All, All right. my experiences with them were good. Um, we had one occasion where there was some evidence of alcohol and uh, John Cadillac that was the other faculty advisor he, he'd been a farmhouse member got up and gave one of the nicest talks on the pros and cons that I have heard and um, come to find out our students were not involved they were completely innocent of the accusation so I felt very good about yeah. that but uh, uh, that's been a, a, a real uh, do you still do you continue do you, have you gone do you still go to some things there 
uh, yes, but you know, it's not as easy, even though that you were a faculty advisor and there in partner every day some years ago, the, the, uh, all new students. And so yeah, if you go in there now, you gotta explain, yeah. <laughs> explain to everybody. Yeah. I, don't, I don't know one now, I don't know one. And so- uh, I know I, what you're saying. Yeah. 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 Talk a little but, about your, make a couple comments about your research in the 4-H, you're really a specialty. And I like that thing in your Vita where you put in interdisciplinary. I thought that was very, a good point. You know, I, I was, uh, I don't know how I could have had a better career. Because I had a, a very rewarding career as a teacher. I had a fantastic career as a researcher, and I'll tell you about that in just a minute. And. I really enjoyed international agricultural development, yeah, and I had almost a full career in that. I enjoyed sports, and I had essentially a career in coaching in trap and ski. So um, I, I want to be sure to mention that because it, it, not often do you have, all have the opportunity to really excel together. in all of those areas. Right. Um, the, the, the interdisciplinary research comes, goes back to my childhood. And you lived on a farm and you had animals and you had crops and, and uh, you had machinery and everything. So you had to be able to work in all those areas. And um, I was in agronomy and crops, but I specialized in forage crops, alfalfa and orchard grass, those types of, of crops. And uh, I always said I, I really enjoyed producing alfalfa. The dairy farm, the cows really squirt out the milk when you give them good alfalfa hay. And so that was my way to help the dairy farmers. And I didn't have to treat. get up at four o'clock in the morning <laughs> and milk cows. Uh, but um, probably the, the break that I got was that the person that I re replaced, um, Merle Teal, when he left, he had a a uh, project with Carl Noller in animal science that was on the Normandy farm down at, uh, near Indianapolis. Um, uh, and um, so I was just kind of told, uh, you can work with Dr. Noller. Well, you never know, I, I had no idea who he was or anything. And it uh, just, uh, w we worked together very well. He was. Uh, very hardworking, uh, honest, uh, and has all those traits that you can work with somebody for years and never have any fallout, any kind of a, of a problem. And so we got started, and then it expanded into some of the other professors, but usually when it was with some other professor, it was three of us then. It was kind of a, a team effort. And so that was the animal science aspect. Um, there's a lot of insect problems on when you've got a lot of leaves there's going to be insects going to chew away at it. And so I got involved in entomology with uh, Professor Kurt Wilson. And Kurt Wilson was uh, had those same personal traits um, as Dr. Noller. He was you know an expert in his area. Um, he was as honest, he just 100% honest and easy, maybe I shouldn't say necessarily say easy to work with, but as long as you did the right things, he sure. did the right things, everything went well. Yeah, he expected, his expectations were high. And um, we had uh, a lot of graduate students, trained a lot of graduate students. When you're doing a lot of teaching, you're gonna get your research done through grad students. And sometimes I had as many as 10 grad students, it's almost unheard of. But as long as I could manage them, keep them from working here and there, uh, we could get a lot done. And I do not know how many grad students I have yet. I had a four drawer file downstairs here, and I have started going through that and throwing out all the papers except the one that we sign when they pass their final. And then I'm gonna itemize a list. And, uh, uh, that would be nice. I, 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 it was rather emotional going through that uh, because there were students that you, oh, I kind of forgotten that one, and then others that uh, 
you'd had a great deal of involvement. Some of them have already passed away, which is kind of sad, and uh, that we were real good friends. And uh, uh, so, uh, and I should bring in one more um, item, and that is I had uh, a grad student uh, back in the late 70s, early 80s, uh, Ekpo Osam. And the way I got involved with him was that we were on a, in Brazil from 1973 to 75, and he taught my class, uh, uh, well, uh, while one, you were one of my colleagues, B.J. Yeah. Um, Hankins, taught my classes while I was gone. And so I owed him something. <laughs> we, we didn't talk about it particularly, you know, but he one day he said, Chuck, I got this uh, applicant from Nigeria that I'd like to take him on, but he says, be my first PhD student. And he says, I just would feel more comfortable if you'd be kind of the co-major professor and um, um, kind of help us out if we need help. I said, sure, BJ, I'd be glad to do that. Well, the interesting thing was six months after the student arrived, BJ Hankins accepted a job at uh, University of Arkansas, his, back to his alma mater. And so we were, we were together. He was my grad student, and I didn't particularly think about it at the time, but um, he was, uh, he and I got along really well. He came out to the house a number of times and knew the family, and he would cook a Nigerian meal for us and have, show us the costumes and, and all that sort of thing, and, and we um, just built up a very good friendship, and he did quite a bit of research here, and we started publishing uh, some papers before he graduated. He graduated in 1981 and went back to Nigeria. And we continued to cooperate on projects that he was doing back in Nigeria. So I have publications on mangrove swamps and things that you would never expect me to be publishing on. And um, um, his father died a few years after that. And his father was a tribal leader and um, Ekpo was the oldest child, so he was responsible for all the ceremonies and thing, expenses of the funeral. And he didn't have the money. So he sent me a telex in those days. It was telex. Mm -hmm. And uh, asked me if I'd send him some money for his dad's funeral. So I just emailed back, you tell me how much and how to send it. And so we got it over there to him. and. And uh, it was only a thousand dollars. You know, I thought my feet here. You aren't going to bury anybody <laughs> for a thousand dollars, and uh, um, uh, so that kind of bonded our friendship a little bit more. And then uh, the economy went really sour, and his uh, salary was cut to the point where he couldn't survive there. So he moved to Papua New Guinea, clear over by Australia. And his family didn't move. They stayed with the family clan in, in Nigeria, and he was over there for 10 years. But we continued to do research in Even Papua there. New Guinea. Oh, good. So and a long lasting relationship then, uh, collaboration. It, it, that's the reason I'm telling the story, because it's going to get longer. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and um, my son was at Texas A&M finishing a PhD. And it was some of the research that we needed. He was a soil scientist in agronomy too. And so we involved him. And so then it became three of us involved in research in Papua New Guinea. And then in 2000, he moved to Swaziland back in Africa so his children, his family could, and wife could be with him there. And uh, our research even intensified hmm. then. And that's another thing. I don't know how many publications that we have, but I'm now publishing scientific journal articles on agronomy in the seventh decade, seventh decade. And I have six or seven already in this decade, and they're all with him and my son. And so it, it, there's more to the story. He sent his, no, he didn't send it because the oldest daughter decided out of high school she wanted to come to the United States for a degree. And the parents weren't in favor, but she was 
strong, isn't it? She came to Alabama. And so then he would contact me and kind of help have me contact the university there and work things out. And um, then she moved to Texas Southern in Texas because of a friend from Nigeria, uh, a lady friend. And um, she um, wasn't able to come up with any money for the last year. Couldn't borrow money anywhere. And so we helped her through. And she graduated, and that was about five years ago. And we were invited to the graduation. So we went, and that was, it was neat. And then within a year or two, she got married. And we were invited to the wedding in Houston. And that was uh, a fantastic experience because it essentially was a Nigerian um, wedding. The ceremony was similar to ours, but then afterwards the dinner and the dancing and the music and everything was uh, strictly Nigerian. And so we enjoyed that. And then she had a younger sister that came over and she went to Sam Houston Institute, or Sam Houston, excuse me, um, State University, and uh, um, she graduated this past May the 11th, and we were there for her graduation. We were invited in, we were there. And then the father, since they are, they're now in um, Samoa, the University of South Pacific, had ordered her to get married, she was going to get married. You graduate and get married on the same weekend so that we just buy one plane ticket. So on the, the 13th, we were at the graduation, and the 15th, we were at the, at the uh, wedding. And again, it was a very exciting one. So, um, And my grad student now is head of the agriculture department in Samoa, the University of South Pacific. And so I'm not quite sure now what that does to our research program. So it could be my research program is finally going to Come we'll see how it works close out. to an end. Sure. Yes. All right. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, the um, you were the associate director of the division of international programs in agriculture. You make a couple of comments on that, and also that uh, you had a con connection. It was connected with Midwestern universities, and then you got that A AID funded, and you were the director on that. If you comment on that, <clears throat> I'm going to back up just a little okay, bit sorry. Uh, to the associate directorship because. Okay. Um, the reason I got into that position was that I had been involved in a number of foreign assignments prior to that. Okay. My first uh, involvement was 1965 in Brazil, and I went there for two months. Uh, was that the one at Viscosa? Or no, not? Oh, no, not. that okay. was neither one at that time. Oh, okay. That was uh, IRI, the IBEC Research Institute, which was Rockefeller, oh, okay. and my major professor. Ed, Ed was working with them and down there as a, a consultant and on a long-term assignment. So I spent, that, that got me started with two, two months at that time. And then um, uh, in 1973, an opportunity came for a long-term assignment in Brazil. In Brazil, yeah. Now, okay. we had, had had a, a, um, a large institution building project at Vasosa that uh, started in the late 60s. And a number of our faculty went there to help build their graduate program. As did other schools such as uh, Home Ec was down there too, Mary Louise Foster? Yes, okay. yes. And, and animal science, well, right. uh, all the disciplines. And they built a strong graduate school there. Now what's happened now is that those professors that we trained are retiring and so the- Down there? Yes. Okay. And. Uh, are they going to be able to find professors mm -hmm. to, to continue that? But um, I, in 1973, they started a new AID project, and this one was strictly research. The other one had been graduate training. And this one, they, um, it's like our USDA, only theirs had a different acronym, of course. And the level of expertise of those scientists was not what it should be. And so what they did, 
<laughs> rather than just firing all those and everything. They just kept that on until those people retired. They stayed on, and they formed a new organization that the, the acronym is Embrapa. And that's what we went down under. So we were there in that transition. It's, it's, I say that because that's a difficult time. And they were forming a new organization. And a lot of that, our work was identifying the young scientists to send up here to train so that they would have PhDs to run national centers. Okay. And I was at, uh, was the director, the U.S. director, uh, at the corn and sorghum uh, center in um, in the state of uh, Minas Gerais. It's the same state that uh, Vasosa was on. We were at Seche Lagoa, Seven Lakes. And we were there for two years and a half and got the program um, well underway. Uh, it, it was actually quite a successful program. And Wisconsin had the soybean program, and you'll hear a lot of publicity about the soybeans and the competition to the United States from from that, and uh, they grew no soybeans when we went down there in, in 1973. So that that was really kind of what that long-term assignment got me a okay. lot of experience. Were they doing corn down there though? Uh, they were growing corn, but they their corn yields when we went down there were exactly what they were here in the United States in 1933. Okay. Yeah, it, only a few th 30 bushel per acre, so okay. now we get yeah. 150, 200, and we've gotten as high as 400. Yeah. So it's it's uh, it's an amazing story. And then, as because of my some Portuguese capability, I worked in Portugal in 1970, 1981, 82, and 84. In 82, I taught for a semester at the uh, University of Evra, and. Uh, then it was after I went to the associate director that worked in, in Poland. And in 84, uh, 84, 84, I uh, worked in uh, Africa some too, in the state, state of uh, Burkina Faso at the headquarters. The capital there is Ouagadougou. It's kind of a fun word to say once you learn how to say it. And uh, uh, so I had this experience. this experience, and so when this position came up as associate director in 1987, I just walked over to, decided one day, I think I'll go over and talk to Woods Thomas, because we, we'd been through a lot in Brazil and that sort of thing. And uh, um, <laughs> we chatted for about an hour about everything except the job, and uh, got through and he says, well, if you want, it, the job's yours. And so within a few days, I was in uh, international programs in agriculture. There, there's actually two programs. There's international programs in agriculture and international programs. International programs is university-wide. and But most of the um, projects were agriculture and they were USAID funded because what we were trying to, we, we went into countries that were communist or the communists were trying to take over during the Cold War. And uh, so we would go in to try to befriend them and help them and show them that we had a better way than sure. the communists had. Um, it, it was better that when you, when I was working, I never had that in mind because I went there to, it, it's a nice, a fantastic opportunity because you go there to work with professors and nine out of ten of those professors are really eager to work with you mm -hmm. to learn what they can and so I you go there and you have a hundred percent confidence with them and your friends immediately and uh, um, I really I really enjoyed that in in Poland um, we took a it, it's almost impossible what we did but they 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 had no up-to-date technology in the Porges area, my area. And I wanted to write a book. I'd talked to several professors that we write a book for. And so I went back here and, and I went to talk to my dean, Dean Lechtenberg, that's now provost. And you know I helped him along as a grad student and all that sort of thing. And, 
I was just going to tell him, I'll work uh, half day in my office, and then half day I'm going to go and hide and write a book. And he said, I went to see him at 1 o'clock, and one fifteen, I was out of there and, and told him, no, you can't do that. And I walked back to my office, and I thought, boy, i got to do something. So I sat there for a little bit, and I saw this book on my desk. I thought, who could translate that book if those authors would let me? So I knew the people that that had published it, so I called him up. He said, wow, he said, that sounds just exactly like what uh, we would want to do, but we can't give you permission to do that. You've got to talk to the authors. And I, I kind of knew, professionally knew the three of them, and so I wrote a two-page letter to, to the three of them, told them what I wanted to do, and asking permission to translate the book, no royalty, <laughs> they, they don't give you anything out of it. And uh, they wrote back, they were just thrilled, and we wound up translating it, and they, in this institute, actually gave us five thousand dollars for to help translate the book into Polish. And then later they went to uh, China on a workshop, and they found the same thing there. So they realized what Riker had done. So they said, "We're going to translate our book to Chinese," and then the book got translated to Spanish too, because it's used in Mexico. So. Uh, that was it was a project that got done for almost no money with ter that reaped tremendous great uh, rewards though. benefits yeah but going back now then to the my assignment as, as associate director was really pretty simple the biggest problem is we have the office of international programs in agriculture but there's no money and so you have to constantly be trying mm -hmm. to find money and so um, and my other assignment was to help manage these projects that we had overseas. That were already ongoing. Mm -hmm. And that's what I really like to do. But somebody, <laughs> if, you got it, if we have no money, we don't do anything. So I, I was, was actually quite successful at that. But that's where I came in to Musea. Purdue University has won all the members of Musea, Midwest Universities Consortium. Is that consortium, does that still exist today? No. Then? Oh, okay. No. Was um, a, I've heard the name, but when I saw that you've been involved, that's why I wanted you to make a comment um, on that. You, you know, it... Um, it was just the big... Was it the Big Ten? It, it was a big... Did we have University of Chicago in there, too? The, I, I, it's hard you to know, tell, University but basically it was the Big it wasn't Ten. The university, it, oh, it's a, uh, Iowa, University of Iowa. Iowa State. It was, we didn't have Iowa State. We had University, university of, of Iowa. Because... Okay. Iowa State was a member of MEAC, and I don't remember what that oh, acronym, but that was more like the Big 12. And that was a fantastic experience because we had one from each one, so it wasn't uncommon for us to have a bunch of Big Ten presidents together, you know, talking to us, because they knew pretty well what we were doing. And we had... Um, um, people that were really organized and hardworking, and we won an $80 million project that, uh, uh, and Purdue was the, somebody in, in MEAC takes the lead institution, we were the lead institution. So I had that responsibility of kind of putting that project together. Our big competition was SUNY in New York, our proposal that was sent to USAID weighed 80 pounds because we had to have CVs of all the, it, it, whether you win or not depends on the quality of staff that you can provide. And so I think we, I had 80 from Purdue University. I'd go around and contact them all and get, sure. them, get the information and put it together. And uh, then I wound up as project manager of that project. Um, this, to me, the sad, I thought, boy, this is what I'm going to do until I retire. It was a 10-year project, and that was 89. And uh, now we went over there. I went, I went over with uh, one of our, the, the lady from uh, the MEAC office, plus three or four other Big Ten university. Um, in, we had an engineer and a biologist, and um, we had 10 schools, and one was going to be agriculture, but we were going to start on four. And then after a 
couple three years we'd start on some more and, and kind of do it over 10 years. And uh, um, the Cold War ended in 1990 sometime or other. And that's when I kind of sadly found out that we were over there because uh, we were, the United States needed to ship weapons through Pakistan into Afghanistan to combat the Russians. <laughs> we're still trying to do the same thing over there with, with, with Afghanistan. And so when that Cold War ended, they didn't need to spend that $80 million on Pakistan. So they terminated our project. And they, I flew into Washington, D.C. to the State Department to hear a report as to the future of our project. It, we kind of knew when we went in what the future was. and uh, But you always kind of think that, okay, now, yeah, you're going to cut this money, but maybe we could salvage a little something and do this or that. And so I asked the question. I said, hope is the last thing to die. Is there any hope that we can continue any phase of this project? And he looked at me and he says, no. So I picked up my suitcase and briefcase and came home and started working on something All else. Right. But uh, well, let me uh, uh, this Midwest was it just agriculture projects or did they, no 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 they were involved no. in a number. I mean, yes. the researchers might ask was since that was your your focus, but they cover there were other projects. Okay. It, it, yes, I um, you know and it depend on the project is what. And that's the reason I say there was international programs uh, okay. also. Um, Along with the one that was in it, agriculture. It, it, was, there were two yes, little units there. Yes, okay. and Woods Thomas was director of both until he retired. And then when he retired, then they, they um, hired uh, separate ones. But um, it's tougher to get money now. There, it, it, it's, it, I've heard some exciting news recently that maybe from the Gates Buffett Foundation, they got slugs of money, billions of money. Now, Warren that, Buffett? Yeah, yeah. That they may be able to get uh, uh, some nutrition projects, something uh, along those lines um, uh, from them. But the, the problem since the end of the Cold War is that, that uh, the projects, all those projects that I mentioned, uh, going to Brazil, going to Africa. Portugal. Portugal, yeah. not Poland. Poland was a, a private fund, a Mellon, from the Mellon Foundation, that uh, uh, <laughs> we, we had a, uh, a colleague, Dick Gilslechter, that had been in agriculture extension, that uh, worked in our office and retired from extension, came into our office, that was able to get a, a grant from Mellon Foundation. Mellon Foundation was over there um, I've forgotten what they call it technically, to wire their universities and everything, the libraries, so that uh, for modern communications. Right. And uh, they were funding that and some way or other when they were over there Dick was able to get hold of this one fellow and wrote him a letter and told him what we wanted to do with a couple of universities. And uh, he'd been over there and seen what was going on and gave us a, I don't know, I don't know whether we got $100,000 out of it total or maybe we got more than that because we had several trips over there and brought some people over here. It was a very productive, very productive. Um, any of those projects, if you can get some of their expertise together with our expertise, it's going to be mutually sure. mutually beneficial. But uh, how long but, how long were you the uh, uh, did you have that position? Uh, until I retired in ninety six. Oh, you still kept that on the associate director. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay, mm -hmm. all right. Yep. As, as well as in agronomy, as the department faculty member in agronomy. Yes, but okay. I really didn't have any responsibilities in agronomy. Okay. I may have been on a graduate committee or sure. two. Sometimes okay. you get an international student that's involved in one of our projects, and so okay. uh, and it, it might be in entomology, uh, 
I, I remember specifically that uh, being on committees for some in, in uh, uh, entomology, um, wherever the need was, that's, sure. that's where it went. Did, were you able to continue doing any teaching at that time when you were over there with that associate or your position there? Probably not. Uh, very limited. Yeah. I might give a, 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 a seminar right. or occasionally. Um, and, you know, since I've retired, I have two Nigerian outfits, and uh, um, my son teaches at Illinois State University, and he's had me come in and talking about soils and so forth. Sure. And, but, and I've worn that uh, outfit to uh, uh, As part those, of the those classes. You know, it really went over it well. It adds to it. it sure. I, I, I yeah. just was amazed at, at the interest that the students got for Africa. Uh, as a kid growing up, I was always like to read the encyclopedia. I'd go to the encyclopedia and read about Africa. And uh, uh, so my experiences were all really sure. exciting. Yeah. One qu uh, thing I wanted to ask you uh, for researchers, I thought one of the things that you were involved in was that uh, Franco Francophone France. Oh, that's a Wagadougou. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it, well, Frank, Francophone France. It, it's it, not we, a term that I hear that often. Okay. Well, it, I understand it because um, uh, you're much younger than I am, but you're still old enough to know it uh, used to be French West Africa. Okay. I and, thought there had to be some time. We, we in can't that. call it. You, you can't. Uh, in uh, the Gold Coast and uh, Coupe de Avore, you, you can't you can't use the English. You have to use the French. Yeah, I, you know, I, it's a, it's a politically correct sort of thing. I understand. Yeah. So yeah, your francophone is fantastic. But you just you just think French West Africa, and that was those countries there that, uh, that were part, were of, the, right. part of the French yeah. Empire. Okay. Yeah. Um, and. Maybe, I don't know whether I should say this or not, but those are really poor countries. When I was there in 84, this is hard to believe, in Burkina Faso used to be a revolta when you had French West Africa. And um, the literacy rate of the women, this, this is the literacy rate, was one to five percent. One to five percent. That meant most of them were illiterate. Men was five to 10 percent. You had eight million people. How are you going to educate them? You have no teachers. You have no schools. You know, you can say, well, we've got to educate them. Well, it's a nice thing to do. But it's People, very don't, people don't realize that, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to stop for a minute. I, I'm going to ask you, I've got some other things, but I try to keep this to a sort of